Hey guys, I'm Siobhan, a fourth year medical resident specializing in rheumatology. Tonight, I'm doing a night shift in the intensive care unit and I'm bringing you along as we take care of the sickest patients in the hospital. Okay, so I just got handover from the daytime resident. I've got the ICU pager. I've got a patient list, so I know all of the details I need to follow up on tonight. Um, and otherwise, things look pretty good here. Um, to be honest, I was a little bit nervous picking up like, an ICU night shift during the COVID pandemic. And because in Ontario, we're kind of going through the second wave of COVID right now, it's at least starting. Um, but um, for now, we only have one suspected case here in the intensive care unit, so I'm really hoping it stays that way. Um, people are doing a good job. Um, all right, let's see what this is. Hi, this is Siobhan from the ICU, we're turning a page. Oh yeah. How much oxygen? You know what, that sounds really reasonable. Why don't I come up and we can talk in person and I can actually see the patient too. All right, so that was the step down unit. Uh, the step down units, like there's the ward unit, the step down unit, and then the intensive care unit, which is here. And it all depends how sick a patient is about which unit they go to. Um, so this patient is requiring now 100% oxygen uh, and they're worried that the patient's requiring more effort to breathe and maybe they'll even need to get intubated. So you know what, rather than just talking on the phone, I've learned over time that sometimes it's just better to show up and see the person yourself and then help make that assessment. Hair up, mask on, let's go. Okay, so I've just spoken to the attending physician uh, in the ICU, so my supervisor, and he agrees with bringing the patient down to the ICU. So when he gets down here, I'm gonna insert um, a pigtail chest tube. Yes, it's actually called a pigtail, um, and I'll show you why. So this is a small bore chest tube, and you can definitely see why it's called a pigtail. It gets inserted between two ribs, and it stays in the chest to drain out fluid. If you look closely, you can see there are a bunch of small holes along the tube, and this is to prevent it from getting blocked. And the reason the catheter is curled like this is really to hold it in place. Okay, so that went really well. We got about a liter and a half of fluid out of his chest, and he's breathing much more easily now, so definitely a win. And now I'm back in my call room, small but sweet. <laughs> um, and I figured, I'd give you guys a little bit of an update on life. So, whoa. Um, so, as some of you know, I just wrote this massive exam called the Internal Medicine Royal College exam. We studied for like an actually a year for this exam. And then it got postponed because of the coronavirus pandemic. And then we finally got to write it a couple of weeks ago. And it just feels like this huge weight has been lifted from me. It feels amazing. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, like. Siobhan, didn't you get into a rheumatology program? Like, what are you doing in the ICU? <laughs> so you're right, I, I am a rheumatology resident, but I also really love internal medicine and I don't wanna lose my comfort treating really sick patients and like dealing with critical care. Uh, so I'm choosing to pick up ICU shifts um, over the next two years while I'm doing my rheumatology training so that by the end, I still feel comfortable with internal medicine and can be you know, a rheumatologist as well. So that's the plan anyway, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, so at this point, things actually seem tied up. Dare I say it? Should we try to get some sleep? It feels too early, it feels wrong, but uh, I'm gonna take advantage if possible. <laughs> that's so strange, there's a flashlight beside the light switch. Actually, I guess that's because there's no lamp beside the bed. Okay, this is what we'll do. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I only just sat on the bed. It's classic. Oh, and this flashlight doesn't work. Oh boy. Hi, this is Siobhan from IC, returning a page. 
Oh yeah. Is um is that the post op patient? Right. Hmm. Yeah, that's not very much. Okay. Um, and we've already given how much fluids? Right. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna come and see him and then we'll make a plan. Okay, thanks. Okay, see you soon, bye. Okay, so this is a patient that I saw earlier when I was walking around uh, to see all the patients. And um, he had a pretty large abdominal surgery uh, just yesterday. And today his urine output was down and I thought he was just, oh my gosh, another one. Okay. I just thought he was dehydrated. And so we've been giving him more fluids, but his blood pressure is a bit soft and he's still not making urine. So I'm starting to think he may have something called abdominal compartment syndrome. This is what I'm thinking. So I'm gonna ask the nurse to do something called a bladder pressure. It's actually very cool. I'll explain in a minute. I just should answer this page. One sec. Hey, it's Siobhan from ICU. Oh, okay, it must have been a double page. Actually, um, I was just gonna come and see you, but um, I'm really concerned about abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, do you think you could do a bladder pressure just to see? That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just, um, I'll either be around or, or give me a, a page when you're done. Awesome, thank you. Okay, bye. Abdominal compartment syndrome occurs when fluid rapidly builds up in the abdomen, causing high pressures. This can happen after abdominal surgery, trauma, or even pancreatitis. You can imagine as pressures rise, it compresses all the abdominal organs, including the bladder. So one way to test for this is by measuring the pressure inside the bladder. If it's high, I'm gonna be calling general surgery tonight. Hi, it's Siobhan from IC, returning the page. Oh, yeah, I'll be right there. Okay, yeah, okay, bye. A patient here in the ICU is in a dangerous cardiac rhythm called ventricular tachycardia. As I rush into the room, the patient is unconscious and his bedside nurse is already doing CPR. While CPR is continuing, we put defibrillator pads on the patient's chest and try to break the abnormal rhythm by shocking him. But it doesn't work, so we restart CPR. At this point, we're following a well-outlined algorithm, and in two minutes, we hold CPR and shock the patient again. This time, it works! The shock has brought his heart rate into a normal rhythm again. So this is a patient with severe heart disease and a previous heart attack. So I suspect the arrhythmia was caused by a scar in his heart. And he'll probably need to have an implanted defibrillator in case this ever happens again in the future, especially when he's not in the hospital. Oh man, wow. So this night has been so busy and it's actually been extremely hard to even film. <sighs> okay, so you didn't even hear about all the patients. <laughs> so of the patients that you know, the one that arrested is actually quite stable now after getting shocked. Um, the chest tube patient doing really well. The abdominal compartment syndrome patient is going to the OR. Gen Surge is taking them this morning. Um, and you didn't know that I went and saw three patients up on the ward who needed help. There was a seizure, patient had a heart attack, I had to transfer them to a different hospital. It's been crazy. Yeah, crazy but exciting. And um, had like a lot of great support from my staff and um, from other, like I had to call cardiology and I have to wake up a lot of people at home and there's a lot of support, which is really nice. But now I don't really know what to do. I sort of have an hour until I hand over and I'm a little bit wired from all this excitement. So, but maybe I should try to sleep because I haven't gotten any yet. 
<laughs> oh boy. So I was just thinking, reflecting that it must seem really cold. It could actually seem insensitive that I just talk about people like their medical condition, like the abdominal compartment syndrome person or the chest tube person. And I just want to say that I use that as a tool to be able to communicate with you guys because I can't tell you patients' names and personal details. But I really, really do remember all these personal details about patients that I see. I just can't share them with you. So definitely not the way all doctors think. People are not just their conditions. So that's it. I'm done heading home, handed over all the issues to someone else. <laughs> no, but really it was a great night and I actually, I had an amazing time and I have a ton of energy, which I don't understand. So <laughs> I'm sure that won't last for long. Anyway, if you want to see more videos like this, then be sure to subscribe and otherwise I'll be seeing you in the next video. So bye for now.